The place is Munich, the capital city of Bavaria in southern Germany. Inside a luxury nine-room apartment in Prinz Regentenplatz 16, a 23-year-old woman is found dead. The date is September the 18th, 1931, six months before the presidential election. The dead woman is Geli Raubel, but the apartment is not hers. It belongs to her uncle. He happens to be one of the men running for president in the upcoming election, the leader of the second largest party in the country, Adolf Hitler. Angela Raubel, affectionately known to her friends and family as Geli, was born on the 4th of June 1908 in the city of Linz in northern Austria. Her father died when she was just two years old, leaving her mother to support the family on her own. At the end of the First World War, Geli moved with her mother and her sister to a fairly plain flat in Vienna, where her mother ran a boarding house for Jewish students. Once during student riots in the city, Mrs. Raubel wielded a club to defend her Jewish students from anti-Semitic rioters. In 1919, Mrs. Raubel unexpectedly heard from a man she had not spoken to in a decade, her younger half-brother, Adolf Hitler. Out of touch with his entire family, Hitler wanted to reconnect with his half-sister, whom he remembered fondly from their childhood. At this time, Hitler was working in Munich for German military intelligence, with particular orders to infiltrate the German Workers' Party, a nationalist, anti-Semitic, anti-Marxist and anti-capitalist political group with barely 50 members. Following orders from army intelligence, Hitler joined the party in September 1919 and quickly rose to prominence, designing the swastika banner and leaving the army in March 1920 to become a full-time party worker. That year, the party rebranded itself as the Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the Nazi Party. Through the 1920s, Hitler would secretly visit the Raubels in Vienna, and he developed a close relationship with Geli, whom he invited to call him Uncle Alf. In 1923, Hitler led a failed coup d'etat in Munich. He was arrested and tried for treason, and sent to Landsberg prison in 1924, where he wrote the first part of Mein Kampf. His half-sister made the 500-kilometer journey all the way from Vienna to visit him in jail. Perhaps in gratitude for this support, in 1928 Hitler hired Mrs. Raubel to be his housekeeper. Geli accompanied her mother when they left Vienna. In Munich, Geli made quite the impression on all who met her. A deeply religious person, she was full of life and expression. People who met her described her as tall and beautiful. They recalled how she would stride down the street singing pleasantly and excitedly enjoy the company of others. To the more self-guarded society of Munich, Geli was surprisingly simple and straightforward in her emotions and opinions. Uncle Alf took her everywhere with him, even into political meetings, and she would enchant the men around her. And Hitler would spoil her rotten in return, indulging her desire to become a professional singer by paying for the finest music teachers buying her the finest clothes and escorting her to cafes and the cinema. He rarely left her side. To him, Geli was irresistibly charming. If Geli wanted to go swimming, it was more important to Hitler than the most important conference. In 1929, Hitler took a lush apartment in Munich's Prinzregentenstrasse. It had nine rooms, including two kitchens and two bathrooms. He sent Geli's mother to look after his rented mountain villa in Obersalzburg, the Berghof near Berchtesgaden, on the Austrian border. Meanwhile, 20-year-old Geli lived alone with 40-year-old Uncle Alf in the apartment in Munich. It was here that her body was found on Saturday the 19th of September 1931. The details of the day are unclear, but this is the most likely version of events. The married housekeeper couple who lived in the building thought that it was odd that they hadn't heard anything from inside the apartment all morning. They knew Geli was at home, but when they knocked on the door, she didn't reply. They thought they had heard a small cry from inside the apartment, but apart from that, they didn't hear anything to arouse their suspicions. In fact, no witnesses reported hearing a gunshot. The housekeepers used their key to get into the apartment, but found Geli's room locked from the inside. Hitler was out of town on his way to an election rally in Hamburg, so they called Nazi party officials to help, possibly Hitler's right-hand man, Rudolf Hess, and a locksmith. 
Hess may have been the first person to see Gelly's corpse. Wearing a beige dress and lying in a pool of her own blood, Gelly was on or by her sofa, with a bullet through her chest and a 6.35mm Walter pistol by her side. The pistol belonged to Adolf Hitler, and he always kept it hidden in his bedroom. Hess and the other Nazi party leaders had to act fast. Hitler was the party leader, and a scandal like this could desperately damage his chances in the upcoming election. They had fewer than 48 hours before the Monday morning newspapers reported Gelly's death. Hess immediately contacted Hitler, who was a two-hour drive away in the Deutscherhof Hotel in Nuremberg. Hitler hurried back so fast he even got a speeding ticket. According to Ernst Hamstangl, the Nazi party press liaison officer, Hitler was in a state of hysteria and left the same day to an isolated lakeside cottage 54 kilometers away on the Tegernsee. Hitler ranted at Hess about how his political career and his very life were all over. Meanwhile, the Nazi party launched the cover-up. They issued a communique to the press stating that Hitler had gone into deep mourning after the suicide of his niece. Then, just 25 minutes later, they tried to retract the communique and stop it going out so they could change the wording from suicide to a lamentable accident. But it was too late. Next, they contacted the Bavarian Minister of Justice, Franz Gürtner. Years prior, after the failed coup d'etat, he had secured Hitler's early release from Landsberg prison and had prevented the Nazi party from being outlawed. When Geli Graubel was found dead, Gertner permitted the police doctor only a hasty look at the body, enough to declare it a suicide, before letting the Nazis ship the corpse off to Vienna to be buried before the Bavarian authorities could perform an autopsy. Later, when a public prosecutor tried to start his own inquiry, Gertner stopped it. Put simply, there was never a proper, thorough police investigation. On Monday the 21st of September, the first reports appeared in the newspapers, and they raised many questions. The Münchner Post wondered why Gelly hadn't left a suicide note, and why her nose was broken, along with other serious injuries that the police doctor denied. As the Frankische Tagespost reported, the death of this unusual beauty is surrounded by a mysterious darkness. Very quickly, the press speculated on the real nature of Hitler's relationship with Geli Raubel. The Regensburger Echo suggested that Geli's suicide was a result of their relationship going beyond her strength to endure. Die Fanfare noted that Geli was not the first woman to have attempted or successfully committed suicide after having intimacy with the future Führer. Needless to say, the damage this might do to Hitler's reputation was nigh incalculable. Nazi party leadership even went so far as to discuss who should replace Hitler in the upcoming election. In court, their lawyers argued that Hitler himself could not look at the papers anymore for fear the terrible smear campaign would kill him. The lawyer's argument is worth mentioning because, within days, the press stopped reporting on the brewing scandal. Thanks to Minister Gertner and the Nazis' threat of lawsuits, the newspapers went silent. So, what happened on that fateful Friday, the 18th of September, 1931? Witnesses describe that the day was marked by a fierce row between Gelly and Hitler, not the first time they had argued that week. Gelly was now 23 years old, and with Hitler's help, studying music. One of the best places in the world to study music was Vienna, where she had grown up. Simply put, she wanted to return there. Uncle Alf, however, would not have it. He had prevented her from leaving Munich before, and there was no way he was going to let her go back to Vienna, of all places. To him, the nest of Jews, Marxists and journalists, his sworn enemies. The only thing we know for sure comes from a letter to a friend she started writing that final day, after her uncle had stormed out in anger. A letter she started, but never finished. When I come to Vienna, Hopefully very soon, we'll drive together to Semmering, and... That final word, und, in German, was never completed. Gelly hadn't even got so far as writing the last letter, when something interrupted her. But like the Münchner Post asked, why would an apparently suicidal young woman start writing such an optimistic, forward-looking letter to a friend? The newspaper's speculation was answered by none other than Hitler himself. He wrote a statement, which the Post was compelled by law to print. 
It is not true that I was having fights again and again with my niece Geli Raubel and that we had a substantial quarrel on Friday or any time before that. It is not true that I was decidedly against her going to Vienna. I was never against her planned trip to Vienna. She wanted to go to Vienna to have her voice checked once again by a voice teacher. It is not true that I left my apartment on September the 18th after a fierce row. There was no row, no excitement, when I left my apartment on that day. In all the varying accounts of what happened that day, Hitler is the only person who claimed he and Geli did not quarrel. Furthermore, the reason he provides for Geli's trip to Vienna seems to undermine the Nazi party's official reason for her suicide. They said she killed herself out of stage fright over her upcoming musical debut. But Hitler says she was going to Vienna to seek practical help for that very performance. Considering this, and the lack of a suicide note, and her unfinished letter, it seems that Geli Raubel did not kill herself for the reason the Nazi party said. Historians and biographers have suggested several different reasons for Geli's suicide, from an illicit engagement to a Jewish music teacher to the discovery of political corruption. They are all unprovable. Inevitably, therefore, we must come back to the most plausible and the most disturbing reason of all, her relationship with Hitler. During the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II, Hermann Goering said, Geli's death had such a devastating effect on Hitler that it changed his relationship to all other people. After her death, Hitler locked the door to her room and let no one in to touch or change anything about it. He commissioned busts and portraits of Geli, one to place in each of his bedrooms in all of his properties. He paid for a huge plot in Vienna's central cemetery for her grave, which he paid someone to look after. If this all sounds very romantic, it probably was. Historian William Shira says, Geli was the only truly deep love affair of Hitler's life. Joachim Fest, who wrote an early biography of Hitler, says, Geli was his great love. In her lifetime, many people, including her own mother, thought Hitler would marry his half-niece, though he would have to obtain papal dispensation to do so. Ernst Hanfstangl said that Geli had the effect of making Hitler behave like a man in love, like an adolescent infatuation, but Geli certainly never gave any impression of reciprocating Hitler's twisted tendernesses. The twisted tenderness Hanfstangl refers to is Hitler's possessive jealousy. Geli wasn't allowed to go out without him, and she certainly couldn't see any other men unless she kept it a total secret from him. Any romantic encounters were quickly quashed by Hitler. His violent self-expression often scared her. But there may be more to their relationship. Otto Strasser, the leader of the left wing of the Nazi party, who fled to Canada during the war and became the Third Reich's enemy number one, according to Josef Goebbels, claimed that, Geli told me that Hitler loved her, but that she couldn't stand it anymore. His jealousy was not the worst of it. He demanded things of her that were simply repulsive. Hitler made her undress while he would lie down on the floor. Then she would have to squat down over his face where he could examine her at close range, and this made him very excited. When the excitement reached its peak, he demanded that she urinate on him, and that gave him his sexual pleasure. Geli said that the whole performance was extremely disgusting to her. Historian Robert Waite said, the idea that Hitler had a sexual perversion particularly abhorrent to women is further supported by a statistic. Of the seven women who, we can be reasonably sure, had intimate relations with Hitler, six committed suicide or seriously attempted to do so. There were also rumours that Geli was at the centre of pornographic material that was almost made public before Hitler suppressed it. The pornographic material in question was supposedly made by Hitler himself. Unfortunately, as tempting as it is to believe that Hitler was sexually perverted, we only have the word of his opponents, who either made these claims after World War II and Hitler's death, or, in the case of Otto Strasser, told these to American intelligence to aid his defection. Nevertheless, in the 2008 edition of his biography of Adolf Hitler, historian Ian Kershaw argues that although there is insufficient evidence to ever know whether or not Hitler's relationship with Geli was physical, Adolf's behaviour towards her does bear all the hallmarks of a latent sexual dependence. We may never know why she committed suicide. And there may be a good reason for that. 
because she might not have committed suicide at all. Fritz Gerlich was an influential right-wing journalist, a nationalist who founded Der Garde Weg in 1930 to oppose the Nazi party. He made his own investigation into Geli Raubel's death. In March 1933, he was ready to publish his findings. But before he did, on the 9th of March, a squad of 50 stormtroopers burst into the office of Der Garde Weg, seized all the documents they could find, and set upon Gerlich. They sent his broken spectacles, spattered with his blood, to his wife. The documents they seized were destroyed. Gerlich was sent to Dachau concentration camp and kept in protective custody. A month later, the man who was the primary source for Gerlich's investigation was murdered. Two other men, a Nazi politician and a priest, were also murdered, purportedly for talking too much about Geli Raubel's death. Fritz Gerlich himself was killed in prison in 1934, during the Night of the Long Dives. Gerlich's colleague and biographer, Baron Irvine von Aretin, said that Gerlich was killed for one simple reason. He had discovered that Hitler murdered Geli. However, we can't know what Gerlich really uncovered, because both he and his papers were destroyed. But it may be significant that Otto Strasser separately claimed that the Catholic priest who helped bury Geli Raubel in the cemetery in Vienna told him, I never would have permitted a suicide to be buried in consecrated ground. Ultimately, however, Hitler had an alibi. His household staff confirmed he left Munich some time after lunch on Friday the 18th, and his chauffeur confirmed that he drove him to the Deutsche Hof Hotel in Nuremberg that night and back again the next day, in the process getting a speeding ticket which places him in the town of Bar Ebenhausen, about 70 kilometers north of Munich, at about 1.30 pm. But since no witness reported hearing a gunshot, we don't know exactly when Geli died. Thus we are faced with a choice. Do we accept the version of events put forward by the Nazis and their collaborators that a nervous debutante caved under performance pressure? Or do we accept the rumours put forward by Hitler's opponents that his sexual proclivities drove her to suicide? Or do we infer that Geli just tried to escape her life with Uncle Alf and paid the ultimate price for it? If you asked Geli's mother, she would say Geli was murdered. But she would also insist that Gethi wasn't killed by Adolf Hitler. But what do you think? Please tell me in the comments below. And a huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters and YouTube members for keeping this channel going. If you want to watch more Just Interesting videos, then click on the screen right now, and I'll see you next time.